Good afternoon. Everyone ready to, to get into the word and to get into exposing what the enemy is doing? First thing I'm going to do is set a timer. Give myself a five-minute warning where I either need to stretch things out or speed things up. Um, putting this together was probably one of the more difficult things that I've done. I'm an educator, so I teach by semester. I can do this in 16 hours. Uh, but to do it in an hour is going to be a challenge. And uh, so when I get going, just hold on, all right? I want to share a little bit about myself and kind of what I went through. You know, for a long time, I was saved at 12, surrendered to the ministry at a Baptist altar on my 13th birthday, so it was my bar mitzvah. <laughs> and um, entered the military when I was 18. And uh, when I, and at the same time I was going through the military, I spent seven years in. I don't equate it with what the guys are serving now because I did it at peacetime. And how many know at wartime, that's a whole different thing. And my head is off to them. Uh, but <laughs> it's easy to, to be in the military when you're just playing like the Russians are coming. It's a whole other thing when they actually hand you real bullets. Um, but when I was going through, I was going through Bible college at the same time. And one of my mentors, while guys were being trained to be pastors, he saw the gift of teaching in me. And so I was being trained to be a Christian educator. And I had been training aspirants of the gospel ministry for the last 30 years. And so I was your basic Baptocostal <laughs> educator that was happy in the matrix and didn't know anything else was going on, you know. And in the late 90s, we began ministering to people that came out of, that were coming out of multi-generational Satanism and discovered the little town that I had, uh, had met my wife when I was at Fort Leonard Wood, married her, got out of the military and just stayed there, thought it was Mayberry RFD, found out it was Amityville. Uh, the occult completely controlled the area. And so we had to learn concepts like uh, satanic ritual abuse, masonic, masonic ritual abuse, multiple personality disorder, mind control. Had to dive into MKUltra and the Monarch Project and just all kinds of crazy stuff. And so my military side of, of my training, not my theological side, kicked in. And, and what I mean from that is when, when I was in Germany and when we were, we were literally 20 minutes by air from... The, the front with, with East Germany and all that. And so you had to understand the doctrine of war of the enemy. And so I wanted to understand, so I have the analytical side. I want to understand the doctrine of war. I'm also a classically trained researcher in theology, and so I began to put it all together. And what I found out was I got sitting down the rabbit hole and I found out that the matrix literally is that which is pulled over our eyes so that we can't see what's going on. And how many know most of the church today is asleep? We are asleep in Laodicea. We, we let the TV lull us to sleep. We think as long as money is flowing, everything is great. And, and the problem is wealth can mimic spirituality, and that is the spiritual state of America. You can have no money at all and be a giant with God. And so as I begin to do all this research and I begin to have occultists come out of the woodwork and give me their books, guys, there is stuff that I've read that I burnt after I read it because it was so profane because it, it really dealt with their belief systems and all the things that they had done. And I begin to, you know, you, you begin to step back and say, you know what? The occult is involved in the political, educational, law enforcement in every level within our society. Now, there are a lot of good cops out there. There are a lot of good, you know, people in politics. But when you're connected to the Masonic Lodge, when you're connected to a lot of these things, there's a spiritual force behind it that becomes the problem. I better give you the slide so you can see what I'm talking about here. I'm so busy talking. I found out the reality of mind control, satanic ritual abuse, multiple personality disorder. The guys, I found out they're systematically poisoning our water, our food, our air. You know, after World War II, you know, it used to be the military-industrial complex. Now it's the military-industrial, agricultural, medical, and everything else that has to do with life. The very guys that engineer the food that make you sick so they can sell you the prescriptions and make you tied into their health care, it's all owned by the same corporations. It's all owned by the same people. 
We're nothing but wealth generation for them. And it's time for us to step out a lot of this. Begin to find out the secret society's web of entanglement in literally every area of society. You know, I began to follow mind control, and then one of the one of the fragments of it led all the way back to the Shriners and the Scottish Rite up in New York City, where they were they were paying to help pioneer it. Besides the CIA and the other organizations, I began to discover that there is a deep occultic intrusion into our churches, our denominations, our seminaries, our theologies, and the spiritual warfare and psychic warfare. If you're a pastor, and you're really trying to push into God and you're doing something for God, there is a witch in your congregation. And it may be the nicest one. It may be the one that never, ever causes any problems. Why? They're sitting back bombarding you and stirring up trouble in church while they look like Mrs. Good, you know, Mr. or Mr. Good, Goody Two-Shoes. That there, are, there is a network that any pastor, any ministry that's doing anything, there's a chart there's a file on you. I mean, we're getting some serious stuff. In our area in Missouri, it all leads back to a core group in St. Louis that's basically controlling that whole area. And, and it's, it's phenomenal. I began to learn how the Luciferian agenda includes both the aspects of completely controlling every individual on the planet and have a deep passion to see the population reduced to just 500 million. You got to cull the herd. You know, in uh, Paul McGuire's new book that got sitting on the table, you know, I need to talk with him because I bought his book and he's already, he's already caused me to buy five new books because he references something and I want, don't want to read the other book. Um, <laughs> And people say, yeah, 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 I looked at the back of your book, too, and it's your fault. I got a whole shelf full. Uh, <laughs> but he, he made a statement that historical, looking, looking at the anthropological data, that human sacrifice has always been an integral part of society to create an elite class. Today, we just call it abortion. And so it's time for us to open up our eyes. If all, all of this took place and got established so much in society because the church was lulled to sleep. You know, there, in our Constitution, dealing with America, there is no such thing as separation of church and state. But there is a constitutional issue of separation of state from church. They're supposed to be silent, not us. They're supposed to serve us. Now, what's interesting is in 1967, the CIA developed a term to help control and hide the things that they do. It was called a conspiracy theorist. Now, in America today, the moment that you raise the term conspiracy theorist, you get, you get images of a guy running around with foil tin on his head, don't you? <laughs> Guys, that is not by accident. That in the unseen hand, I go back to historians and experts. In the unseen hand, which is an outstanding book, and this is a uh, this a scan of the very worn copy I have at home. That a historian shares that there are only two views of history. Only two. Now they they won't tell you this in the news media. The one is that everything happens by accident. Oh, we just don't know how that happened. We don't, we don't know that, you know, somebody gets killed over here and it causes World War I, or this happens over here, and, and the next thing you know, a nation topples. All, all this, we're, we're to think that it's, it's just somebody spit in the wind and it all happened by chance. But there's the second, which is a more historical view of history, that it's conspiratorial. All you have to do is read the Word of God. Psalms chapter 2, why do the heathen range and the kings imagine a vain thing? In the military, where, you know, I was just admin, but I was at the command level, so I got to see how they did military intelligence. I saw a lot of the reports, and, and part of the Game of Thrones, guys, is we conspire against the enemy while at the same time trying to hide our said conspiracy while we're trying to ferret out their conspiracy that they're trying to hide from us. That is the way all nations work. 
it has since the beginning of time. And now we're told to believe that there's any type of conspiracy, you have to have tin foil on your head. But my, my personal opinion is to believe that everything happens by chance requires the tin foil. Now, to understand where we're going, God gives us a hint. In Isaiah 50, 46, 9 and 10, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I like, I like a God like this. See, the, the mighty thing about Almighty God is the moment that he created time. And you find it in the Bible when God said, let there be light. How many know the lights didn't come on? The sun and the stars is a fourth day principle. What God did is God framed the speed of light which created the 12th dimension, the temporal dimension, in which he laid his divine governance over the three heavens. And the moment that he did that, to show you how awesome our God is, he, his, his omnipresence, he fills all time and space. The moment he said, light be, he was already experiencing the millennial reign. He was already the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so as he's doing things... Throughout the history of mankind, the devil's playing checkers and God is playing three-dimensional chess. And so in the stories and everything, he, he helped shape some of those so that we would understand where we were headed. It, many of us are beginning to discover the feasts, and, and they're not just the feast of the Jews, they're the feast of the Lord. They just get to participate because they belong to him. And they're all about Jesus. The first time he came, he was Messiah ben Joseph. He was the Passover lamb. He was the unleavened bread. He was the first fruits when he rose from the dead. We're still at the day of Pentecost. We're supposed to be empowered to take the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, his rulership, his reign, being set free from the power of sin to all the world. We're headed toward the fall feast. How many of those the last trumpet's going to sound? Yom Tura, okay? There's the marriage supper of the Lamb which falls between Yom Tura and the, and the Day of Atonement, 10 days. Day of Atonement, we call it the Valley of Armageddon, the Millennial Reign, Feast of Tabernacles, as well as the Sabbath is a divine rehearsal. The seventh day principle, Almighty God will get his day. It's all there from the very beginning. And so God begins to give us a hint of some things. And to really understand, I don't have time to get into all of it today, but you need to understand Revelation or, or Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 6, and Genesis chapter 11. If you understand those, the book of Revelation will make sense. Because God tells you the end from the beginning. And I want to deal just with a small part of that. When I begin studying esotericism, there, there's a lot, you know, the Word of God only hints at some things because it's not to be a full revelation of everything. It's a revelation of Jesus. It's a revelation of salvation. God could not tell, especially, have, have you noticed that Jesus actually talked more about the devil and the kingdom of darkness and the gospels that is included in the entire Old Testament? Why? He brought the solution. You can't show somebody something that they have no deliverance for and they might run toward you put prophetic hints of it that now as we read, and like Isaiah where it talks about the fall of Lucifer, we know that that's the fall of Lucifer. But still Jews are kind of debating about it. And I think the king of Tyre was actually personally mentored by Lucifer. That's why God was able to hit one bird with two birds with one stone. And so we look at this. And God this, this gives us this little snippet in Genesis 6, 1 through 7. And it came to pass when man began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the Bene Elohim, the sons of God, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that is, he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years." 
there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men and bare them children to them, the same being mighty men, which were men of old, men of renown. I want you to pay attention to that. I'm going to read on, and I want you to hold that into thought. And God saw the imagination, or the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually, so much so that God repented that he had ever made man. Now, in really understanding the dynamic of what's going on there, we need to understand that word giant in the Hebrew, nephal. In Hebrew, you add the im to make it plural, so if you're talking about more than one giant, it's nephalim. But it's only used three times in the entire Word of God. A true, pure-blood Nephilim was only pre-flood. But there's, there's a switch in the language because God is wanting to reveal something to us. The, the Nephilim that it's talking about here in Genesis is where the Greeks get the word Titan from. 480 footers. They're, they were ferocious, they were cunting, they were intellectual, they were, and, and so that they began uh, their, their prowess and their strength and their, their ability to fight and to plan and to scheme and to manipulate things beyond our comprehension. You see, in that time, especially when you understand the mystery religions, they look at that time as the golden age of planet Earth, the time of Atlantis, when sorcery and technology worked in perfect harmony with one another and were basically both the same thing, that occult power could flow through technology to where you couldn't tell one from the other. And the effects of that is that it caused men's imagination to be filled with evil continually. It so corrupted them. They, they taught them witchcraft. They taught them alchemy. They taught them poisoning. They, they taught them things that, that were forbidden knowledge. And if you don't think that that's something that was powerful, I mean, the, the ability to open up dimensional portals and jump from one side of the planet to the other or access hyperspace and all these things, they were doing otherwise major governments, Russia, the U.S., China, many of the major nations are scouring the earth to try to rediscover antediluvian technology that far surpasses what we have today. It was a bad, bad time. And one of the things that, that dawned on me, and this, this is extra, this is not in my notes. And guys, the only reason I have notes is to keep me on track because I can take one point and go three hours. Um, <laughs> Spiritual energy can flow through technology. As a Christian, have you ever turned on the television and somebody's preaching the gospel and the anointing flows out of the TV set? What makes you think that only one kind of spiritual power can flow through it? Deception can flow through it. So many other things. Because there is a spiritual component connected to the watchers about technology. But let's go on a little bit further. I want to look at the second word. That these, these giants became men of renown. They became Gibor. They became the definition. Not only in the word of God. Now this is the principle of first mention. This is the first time Gibor appears in the Hebrew Bible. And it's directly connected with the prowess and the strength and the cunning, the ability to make war, the ability to enslave people. All these things as well as advanced technologies, all that is caught up in the concept of Gibor. That's why we see like in the, um, the Caesars, when they would get to a certain place where they thought they had conquered all, they would announce that they had become a god. What they were saying is, I have finally achieved becoming a Gabor. Does that make sense? Now, the next time that we see this in the Word of God is Genesis chapter 10. And it's just almost a footnote of what Nimrod did, but yet you find what he's doing still continuing in the book of Revelation. There's more there than meets the eye. And in, whenever you read scripture, guys, anytime there's repetition, it's not because God was trying to fill more, make a longer book. 
in Hebrew, repetition means that it's significant. That was their way of bolding, underlining, putting exclamation points. The only thing that is brought to the superlative or the ultimate is if it's repeated three times. And that only happens in two occasions. God is holy, holy, holy. That means his holiness trumps everything else. He is more holy than he is a God of love. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Yes, the cross was demanded by God's holiness primarily and then secondary by his love. The only other third, well, the only other one brought to the superlative is we're going to have angels proclaiming woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth that have not submitted to Jesus. In other words, the ultimate prophecy is about to hit the fan. Okay. So here we have this being repeated twice that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now I want to deal with that before I get into some other things. When you read that in English, it doesn't really mean a lot. But I've read what the rabbis have said. Rabbi Lapin does an excellent job of this. He said he got in the face of God and hunted to draw men away from him. That is the very nature. That is the foundation of everything that is the, of Babylon is to hunt men and take them away from God's family to draw them into a system that will send them to a devil's hell. It was that back then at the very foundation. It's what's going on today. It's the, the mystery of iniquity flows. It causes the, the heart to beat in the city of Babylon. And we need to re realize that that is the primary agenda, to hunt men and take them away from God. But it also says something else here. It said that... Uh, he began to be a Gibor. He began to be a Gibor. Now I want to look here at, at Halal. And it means that he did something to profane, to defile, to pollute. He corrupted his DNA. You see, he did something, and this is the mystery of Nimrod in my estimation, that he did something the watchers couldn't do before the flood. You see, the watchers, it was at the point of conception that the DNA was manipulated. It was in vitro. And they used women as a fit extension to serve as an incubator for that which they were trying to create. Nimrod was a man with human DNA that ended up becoming something else. That is why he is the poster child for transhumanism. He is the poster child for every wizard that gets into alchemy. The whole concept of lead to gold was human to gibberim. He was able to transmute himself and to make him into... Now, that has been lost with time, and the mystery religions are still trying to find it. In fact, Doc Marquis says the only, the only way that we're going to ever discover how to do it again is when he shows back up and gives them the secret sauce. Their job is to get the world in the right place so that he can be revealed. Oh... I'm, 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 I got another book coming out in September, so I'm going to dive into that just for a second. Okay, can I do that? How is the world going to be prepared for him to come back? It's the mystery of iniquity. Herein is the mystery of iniquity revealed, and the Apostle Paul connects it directly with the son of perdition. But we've never thought, what empowers the kingdom of darkness? Iniquity. It's an iniquity force that was created in a Lucifer when he fell. But he is not all powerful like God is. And so he couldn't fuel his own kingdom for very long. And all of a sudden, God creates these beings in his image that can receive and produce after their own kind. If he could get iniquity in them, we, by sinning, become iniquity generators. Come on, think about this. The more that he can get humanity to sin and to abandon the ways of God, and especially if he can get so-called Christians to sinning by the reason of grace, he turns us all into batteries. And when we look about, you know, he that, re that restraineth, and, and, you know, you hear, well, it's, you know, I've always heard it's the church, it's the Holy Spirit, it's 
Dunkin' Donuts, you know, there's this <laughs> everything that's out there, but none of those to include Dunkin' Donuts is included in those scriptures. The mystery of iniquity is one of the concepts that I kept running across when I was studying the occult is that they would have satanic wombs and incubators that were created in hyperspace by the things that they did. The mystery is iniquity in the earth. They've got to raise the iniquity in the earth to the place to where it becomes a womb to maturate the Antichrist. I, I want to bend your paradigm just a little bit, okay? And just like a womb is moved out of the way, when a woman gives birth to a child and, should, and will not move out of the way until the time is right, that's the mystery of iniquity. That's why they have worked so hard to keep us from preaching the cross and to preaching holiness and to preach walking with God and to have taken hyper grace that I've had people get up and say, you know, Jesus conquered Moses. I didn't know Moses was a problem. <laughs> Jesus came to set us free from the law. Were you Jewish? Well, no. Well, then it wasn't a problem to you. Come on. <laughs> Some of this theology. The Apostle John, 30 years after the end of the Apostle Paul's ministry, said sin is the violation of the law because what God has said is sin will forever be sin. The cross did not change God. The cross did not change God, our sin. The cross freed us from the power of sin so that we could lend our members unto righteousness. And the more of us that walk in righteousness, the more that we can postpone the revealing of the son of perdition because he can't maturate in his satanic womb or incubator. That's why revival is so important and why the enemy has so worked to put us to sleep. Now that's a whole other sermon. Um, but I want you to look at some things. It, it says not only uh, did he per, you know, pervert, profane, defile, it also talks about almost things that sounds like the Antichrist. He was pierced through with a mortal wound. And one of the weird ones is to play a flute. Or did he use harmonics to modify his DNA? And I want you to hold on to that because we're going to come back to that when we get to some things that Jesus said and revealed. But he became a Gabor, and he began to establish some things in Babylon. In fact, the rabbis knew exactly where he was headed, the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament that the Apostle Paul preached from when he went to the Gentiles. I mean, God in his wisdom already had a, he never had to t teach those, those guys Hebrew. He just grabbed a Septuagint and just went for it because they all had already learned Greek. And in it, the rabbis literally say that he became a giant. So there was, this, there was this metamorphosis that was going on. But in his program in the Targum for Genesis, the rabbis have said he was mighty in hunting or in prey and sin before the Lord. For he was a hunter of the children of men in their languages, and he said, depart from the religion of Shem. Well, Shem was the righteous one walking with God. Depart from Shem and follow my institutes. Because... I'll teach you how to become a God. Kind of what is going to be the same delusion that is going to happen in the days before. Now, to be truthful, Nimrod would work real well in Washington, D.C. right now. <laughs> he, he was a sophisticated individual, but he was also a savage because he was two-faced. You see, sometimes it takes two faces to work in Washington. He was intelligent, but he was barbaric. He, or he, was, he was civilized, but he could be barbaric when he needed to be. He was intelligent, but it was an intelligence that was demonically twisted. He was an inspiring leader, but at the same time, he would betray you in a heartbeat. How many of us have seen political people that have, I'll change things around unless the political wanes change, then I'll be the first one to throw you under the bus. That's of the spirit of Nimrod. He was religious, but he was full of spiritual darkness. He was a social engineer. Oh, he, he was transforming society. 
He was a world savior, a Luciferian Messiah. At the same time, he deceives the masses for his own glory and his own dark purposes. And he begins to build a city. And, you know, I used to think with the Tower of Babel, you know, before I really wrote this book, I never really had done a detailed study of that. And so I thought Babylon was, you know, there was this little plain in Shinar. And, and these guys started putting mud bricks together. It ticked God off and he come down. And that's all there was, was this dust and a few guys, <laughs> you know. But when, when you look at some things, Edershine says that the size of the Babylon of Nimrod was one to 200 square miles. That's a whole lot bigger than the city of London, I think like five times, if I'm not mistaken, the size of London. It also had a 400-foot wall around it, big enough to hold chariot races, three or four chariots deep. And the reason for that, all they had ever seen for judgment of God was a flood and so the, the only thing that may have survived the flood is the Great Pyramid of Giza, which I personally believe was, was built by the Watchers. And then their children had a little bit different flavor in the way that they built. We, we call it Cyclopean architecture, you know, with, with the monolithic and, and the different things. But it survived, and it's, what, 450 feet, 480, something like that, that survived and so he had a wall about that so that they, if God would judge with a flood, they would have enough time to finish what they were doing with what they were going to do with the tower if God would intervene. So there was a method behind his madness. Because it wasn't about just reaching to heaven. Now, this is out of Logos Bible software. And the Tower of Babel was about 300 foot tall. Pyramid of Giza was one or 480 and then we have some comparisons here. So it wasn't height that he was after. And if, if you're going to want to reach into the heavens, why not start on the top of a mountain instead of in a plane? There, there was something about that geographical location in which I believe he thought he could open up a portal generator to war against God himself. And I wonder when he became a Geberim if his perception of things change others' weak spots between the veil of the first heaven, second heaven, and third heaven. There's weak spots the occult knows about. Some of them are called vortices. And what's interesting, there's always a north and a south, or there's poles. You know, I, I, was, I was amazed to discover that the Bermuda Triangle has the Devil's Triangle on the exact opposite side of the planet. There's, 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 there's magnetic things that go along with those, and they, they know where those are. They know where the ley lines are. And I, I kind of wondered if, if because he had become a Gabor or something else, that he could see that there was a place where he was building the tower that would serve his purpose. And so it wasn't necessarily, because I know, I think it's in the book of, of Jasher, or the book of Jasher, or the book of Jubilees, it, the calculations go up to 5,800 feet. He was building the Empire State Building kind of thing, but I don't think that was it. I, I didn't think he had to. It was, it was a ziggurat. Most, uh, most commentators and most, ar most archaeological uh, believe. But he also wanted to, the war against God. And I'm not going to take time to read this whole thing. This is out of the book of Jasher, that they were planning on dividing up into three teams. One third went here, one third would do another, and one third would do another. And one of the things that I have always wondered if this is where Freemasonry got their 33rd degree. Since they're so enamored with Nimrod and what he wanted to do. You see, because although he was planning on ascending and challenging God himself, I mean, when we get to the end of the book, there's another place on the earth that has a weak point that a portal can be opened. It's called Megiddo. And I have wondered with everything that they're doing with CERN, everything they're doing with transhumanism and everything else, if Nimrod once again is not going to assemble his army, except at the moment that he thinks he's about to trip the switch, Jesus on the other side opens up the portal and comes through. I don't know about you, but I like that. Yeah. Don't have to, and you know, I believe that I'm going to be a part of that army, but it's going to be the same way when the children of Israel come out of Egypt. Is you know, back then they were saying, Go Moses, go, and we're going to say, Go Jesus, go. 
But I, I want to look at the tower, the shape of the Tower of Babel. Now, it's a ziggurat, which basically is a trapezoid shape. And one of the things that I have found in the occult is that the trapezoid shape represents the unfinished work of Nimrod. God came down and intervened and interrupted the work. He, were, he was the first Gibor interrupted. And so the, the, the outline, the Masonic altar, is hidden, but it's slightly trapezoid. What are they announcing on the back of the $1 bill? You see the, the trapezoid there? It's the unfinished work of Nimrod and the fulfillment of it. And then even when you go to the UN, the meditation room in the UN has this solid steel altar that's supposed to have been made out of weapons or whatever, and they're trying to, they said they're going to fulfill what Messiah said without Messiah, that we're going to beat our, our swords into plowshares. But it's set in a trapezoid-shaped room so that the leaders of the nation gather in the very symbol of Nimrod's unfinished work. And see, the trapezoid is a, is a very, inter the, they also call it a frustrum because it's, it's frustrating. It's, it's, it's not, you know, like the pyramid's not completed. It, there's, it's frustrating. And an occultist will tell you how frustrating it is as the hair stands up on the top of their head. But if you notice in, in, in Gothic uh, architecture, they remember an old, uh, an old show called The Monsters? Yeah. And they would have these trapezoid shape outgroves on their house on the roof. One of the things the occult knows is that that shape attracts demonic power. That's why many houses that have trapezoid-shaped eaves will end up being haunted because the children of the watchers are attracted to that site to help complete the work of Nimrod. So when people bow at a Masonic altar, it's the only symbol that will draw demonic energies to empower those who bow before its altar. Things that make you go, hmm. And so they have devoted their lives to it. Now with the mystery religions, it has always been about fulfilling, rediscovering what has been lost in their knowledge since the, the mists of time. And one of the guys that was bit by the um, mystery religion bug was a guy named Solomon through Hiram, who is the champion of the Masons. He kind of came in with David and said, listen, I'm going to give you, uh, because I control the, the cedars of Lebanon, and I'm going to give you the very best choice wood. And so, you know, I helped your dad build his home. And now when Solomon is king, he says, you know what? I'm going to give you whatever you need. And then kind of became a semi-architect because for some reason Solomon in his wisdom thought that he could outsource. And he was bitten by the mystery religion bug. One of the reasons why he was marrying all these women of other nations that was forbidden in Scripture was because he knew at the Tower of Babel when man was split up in 72 groups that the information was split up into 72 groups. So by, and most, if, if you married the daughter of the king, she was a priestess in the mystery religion within that nation. That's why those wives brought in the altars of Ashtaroth and Molech and all that into Jerusalem because they were priestess of that religion and holders of that knowledge. When you read the book of Proverbs, that woman, that sensuous woman, is the whore of Babylon luring you with promises of things that she can't deliver. Because Solomon was bit. And then he writes Ecclesiastes, he says, you know what I found? There ain't nothing new under the sun. They claim they know all this stuff, but there's more they don't know than they do know, but they kind of always hold out this carrot. I remember listening to Bill Sneblin, and he was talking about there was one of the mystery religions that you trained for years to go through this maze blindfolded, and they had dangers in it that uh, many guys died just trying to get through the maze. And those that did to get the ultimate secret of that mystery religion, so when you get to that altar in the center of the maze, they handed you a grain of wheat and said, there is the mystery. 
I'll tell you what, if there would have been a sword handy. <laughs> because there's still some things that they don't know. They're still trying to grasp all the things, the antediluvian things that, that I, I even think that Nimrod may have discovered some of those things. And, and I believe it's the book of Jasher. It talks about that one of the grandsons of Noah found some of the writings of the watchers. And I kind of wonder if that didn't end up in Nimrod's hand. And he would do what our governments are doing today. They're digging stuff up, looking for information. It's called an archaeological dig. And it wasn't invented recently. It's been going on forever. And so one of the things that the mystery religions do is they look throughout history. And guys, they have the long plan. One of the things I postulated in my book is they knew that the leadership of the watchers were incarcerated for 70 generations, which puts them, if you figure out the time the, of the flood and all that, to the, and you figure 70 generations, it's about the beginning of the 20th century. And they bring technology with them. Do you know that there were Roswell crashes before Roswell? Nazi Germany had one as they were a taking power. They gave them some of their advanced technology. Plus, the, the society of real, the women of real, were trans-channeling watchers giving them technology. Then you have the Roswell incident, and you have all these things. It's, it's like these were done on purposes because they were gifts of technology that we could reverse engineer. With the basic information, there's more out there, things more powerful. And if you align with them, here's the little trinkets that you get. We call technology. And I want to deal with one of the guys that helped prepare the way. His name was Adam Weishaupt. Anybody ever heard of him? Founder of Illuminati. What I found interesting is that he was obsessed with the number five. It's called the law of fives within the occult. And here's where I believe it originated. When Lucifer fell, he said, I will five times. Five is the biblical number of grace. He tried to create a pseudo grace that would facilitate his ascension. And what it did is it corrupted him and created iniquity. And so one of the things that I postulate is that Weishaupt wanted to tap into that iniquity force, and he did it by making sure that everything ended up in fives. In fact, before he, he developed his core of what he did, and you had the Rothschilds, and what's interesting, too, is you have a guy named Frank who was an occultist. He was a Kabbalic rabbi. That leads back to another one in 1666 that the, the many of the Jewish world heralded him as Messiah. But he began teaching salvation through iniquity. And Frank put it on steroids and to the fact where he said, he said, fake your conversion to other religions so that you can begin influencing them and bringing them into the fold. And his footsteps lead right to Rothschild and Weishaupt at the formation of the Illuminati, but he did not begin anything until he had five people. Then when we look at fives, and what's interesting when you look at the first one, these goals, that's also the Communist Manifesto, just to throw that out there. Marx didn't create it, he borrowed it from, from Adam Weishaupt. The abolition of monarchies and all ordered government. The abolition of private property and inheritance, the abolition of patriotism and nationalism, do we see that happening today? The abolition of the family, because it takes a village to raise a child. No, it done. It takes a mama and a papa under the anointing of Almighty God to raise a child the right way. <laughs> to get rid of the institution of marriage and the establishment of a communal educational system or a public educational system that you take the kids away from their parents and you let the state teach them. Now, you can have kids in public school, but you better make sure that, sure that public education is supplementing what you're teaching them at home. But we've had generations that sat down and let the let the government take care of everything, and then you wonder why you wake, you wake up one day and your kid is a materialistic atheist. 
because it was not done by accident. He also blended five esoteric concepts, Islam mysticism, Jesuit mind control techniques, Luciferianism, Freemasonry concepts of eternal life, and mind expansion through hallucinogenic drugs. And then he has five stages of, of how uh, mankind will cycle. You know, we, we've seen different cycles where, you know, nations raise up, nations will fall, societies raise up. And so he came with five stages, and bureaucracy is where we are now. And bureaucrats love power. They love creating 900 million trillion regulations that nobody can follow while at the same time they exempt themselves from it because the purpose of the bureaucracy is to be so heavy that society collapses into chaos. And what they believed is if they could usurp this cycle when they came out on the other end into chaos once again, they would be the ones in control. In America, we had a revolution, although there were Masons involved, we had a revolution because we had the revivals of Jonathan Edwards and, and all the others that in Whitfield, that we became such a righteous people that we could no longer tolerate the corruption of Europe was what was behind the revolution here. When, they, when, when you take God out of the equation, their form of revolution, we have the French Revolution bloody and horrible and despicable. Can you see the difference? And they, they, they want to take God out of it and usurp that. But what I see in, when, I, when, I, when I reviewed history is these guys will plan a thousand years in advance. We don't even, most ministries don't have a five-year plan. <laughs> generation after generation after generation, they knew that they could not get what they needed done until the leadership of the watchers were released. So they prepared the way. How can we see that they prepared the way? Well, in the, the 19th century, three things that were essential to the reintroduction of the watcher leadership to mankind was spiritism with the Blavatsky, the very foundation of it, and those that have tried to, to study her, to figure her out, unless you're a member of the elite, you do not get her unedited works. They're only reserved for officials in the Illuminati and the United Nations. And they are priceless because there's a lot of secret sauce of what's coming in there. And one of the things I found, the, the, the serpent in the garden or the Nahesh was a seraphim. And we find out with other manifestations of the seraphim like uh, Quadikazel, Metokuru, they could all take human form as old white guys with beards. Okay? And she talks about the great white council. It wasn't the supremacy of the white race. It was a manifestation of seraphim that had left God that were teaching her things that were forbidden. And so you have that going on. Then from one family... The Darwin family, you have evolution, and then from his cousin, you have eugenics. We can evolve, we can control the DNA, we can manipulate DNA to become more than what we are. Those things were introduced and were essential before the releasing of the watchers, because that's their modus operandi. To tap into spiritual realities that are against the most high and to manipulate DNA and to, to genetically re-engineer man into something else. And they came together in perfect union under the Nazis. That's their Magna Carta right there. That's what they were all about. And one of the things I discovered, and this may be shocking to some, Nazi Germany was not supposed to win World War II. Although there's evidence they're camped out at the South Pole, and I believe, I believe that's probably correct. I think Steve Quayle's right on the money. There's something down there that absolutely freaked out all the nations in the 50s that they signed a charter. Nobody goes back down to Antarctica except on the periphery. And if you become an industrialized nation, you have, there is a charter with the UN that you must sign saying, we will not go down there and probe in the interior. Just want to throw that out. 
This is something to think about. Next time you get on Google, Google Operation High Jump. High Jump. We had Admiral Byrd take a fleet down there. Within just a few days, he'd come back with his tail between his legs because flying saucers came up out of the ocean and decimated his fleet. One of the quotes I give in the book is from Dune, that there are plans within plans within plans. And that's the way the Illuminati do things. They don't trust in just one thing, but they pick up things along the way and begin putting them into place. Every Freemason, every esoteric society go before a trapezoid altar, and there's, there's oaths that they make. And anybody thinks, well, you know, I, I was in the Blue Lodge, and so, you know, it's the higher levels that are the bad stuff. The original oath to enter into the lodge is step-by-step, step, word for word, the exact same ritual to become a witch. You're just not told that. Skull and bones. And what they have done in the last century in America, they have usurped the educational system. You want to find some hard education? Go back and Google eighth grade and fifth grade English tests from the 19th century in America. In the 1900s, when a president would speak, he would speak at the PhD level to his nation. Today, he speaks at the sixth grade level. Do you think that's by accident? When I was talking with Dr. Horn as I was writing this book, I began, you know, and he said, he said, Mike, you need to tone it down. I'm thinking, I'll, I'll just write it on the first year freshman college level, you know. He said, no, 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 sixth grade. And I'm thinking, you know, do we want to make it a pop-up book? or what? Do we <laughs> this is Nimrod, bad, you know. <laughs> but this dumbing down was done on purpose. That modern education goes all the way back to, to a guy in Germany that trained Pavlov. They've turned us into Pavlov's dogs. That they conditioned you to respond to stimuli. They didn't teach you how to think and to think critically. All they wanted to do is they put something up in public and you respond to it just like every time Pavlov rung the bell, his dog, his dog salivated. You want to create a chaos over here or you want them to make them buy the new thing or just go crazy about Pokemon Go. I was listening to Rick Wiles, and there was this guy on a four-wheeler, a 40-year-old guy, and he kept on doing this on his phone, so he called the police. He was, he was taking pictures all the way around his facility. He said, this guy's casing the joint. He was playing Pokemon. A 40-year-old lived in his mom's basement. <laughs> playing Pokemon. And the guy who, who started Pokemon in his own testimony, his parents were Christians. He rejected it and became a Satanist. So the, the whole concept behind Pokemon is satanic. And when you look at where they put these virtual demons, they're finding out that 70% of them are, are, are superimposed over churches. That churches are spawning Places and training places for these dem demons, these pocket monsters that they're trying to capture. And they get so enamored with that. Now, Rome is burning, if you will. I saw a wonderful post. It said, all the followers of Bernie Sanders are going to have a fit about what he has done when the, once they quit playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> now, it may take till after the election. Because we get enamored in these things. They destroyed education. They infiltrated our seminaries. My, my mentor used to sit on the board of a regionally accredit, accreditation association. He told me, Mike, when you start your school, never bring it under it. Because in the 60s, I was told as a board member that one day they're going to destroy all Christian education in America. And one of, the, one of their silver bullets right now is LGBT. That the test case is Gordon College. They have given Gordon College one year to change their theology 
or they will lose their regional accreditation, which means you lose Title IV funding. So you go from being on the, on the government sustenance, you know, for $40 million or $100 million, and that's cut off. That'll bankrupt all Christian education within a few months. Their denominations cannot replace the Guaranteed Student Loan Program. That's one of the reasons that, they, that Obama made it govern, the government, you know, they brought it under government auspices. Mind control. I want to bring that up, and I, want to, I don't want to talk about MKUltra. I want to talk about the TV. The TV is a Nazi invention. The cathode tube was, was developed by the Knights Templar. They thought it was going to be an ability to speak over to the other side. But one of the things that they had found is that when you sit down and watch TV, the side effect is that it puts you into an alpha state mentally, which means your analytical side of your brain is shut down. You no longer analyze and sort and categorize stuff. You begin receiving everything at an emotional level. And it's placed into your unconscious mind. That's your hard drive. That's your sub you're unconscious. It remembers everything. That's where you basic get your basic definitions. And it's doing it at an emotive level. Now, have anybody ever seen Christians that you're telling them the word of God and they're getting mad at you and it's all emotional and there is no rhyme or reason for it, but they would tar and feather you and beat you in Jesus' name if they had half a chance? It's because the TV and the programming on the TV re-engineered society and a level that they could not analyze programmed them to be against the word while the whole time they were claiming they were of the word. Do this experiment. Plead the blood of Jesus between you and the TV set and refuse to go into entertainment mode. I guarantee you that you will yell at your TV, you will rebuke your TV, and you will probably throw your shoes at your TV and say, how in the world did I sit here all this time and watch that garbage? It's because you were programmed to do it. One of the things that we've, let me, let me jump on because I'm running out of time because I want to get to the, why there was a flute with Nimrod, okay? Jesus, when, remember when he taught, he said, he said, he said, now I'm getting ready to give you the keys of the kingdom, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. He took them to Mount Hermon to do that. He took them out of the way to Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is where the watchers fell. Mount Hermon had the entrance to Hades, the Greeks believed, was in Mount Hermon. The fortress of Nimrod was there, and a grotto to Pan. And he made this very interesting statement. He says, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. We don't hear that in the ears of the, what his disciples heard because in the gates is where the council, the leaders of the city dwelt, and hell has its undivine council. And he was speaking it to a man that part of Lucifer's council was imprisoned under the earth the leadership of the watchers, and he was prophesying not to them but to you and me. Now, I've heard ministers say, now the apostles could bind and loose, but we can't bind and loose because that was for them. They never had to deal with a watcher. We're going to have to. And so Jesus stood there and said, I want you to get it. Now, I really want you to understand. Now, they're talking about, you know, the watchers are going to come back saying that I'm, you know, you're, you can become a God and everything else. He went on top of Mount Hermon, and that's where he was transfigured. Just so that they would get the point of who he was compared to what they are. You see, church, our job is not over. The assembling of the gates of hell are beginning to fall into place. We have the Nechesh of Genesis 3. We have, the, uh, we have Lucifer. We have the 72 principalities and powers that fell at the Tower of Babel. And we have the watcher leadership. And Jesus says, when you see this come together in an unparalleled way that you have never seen before in church history, that the gates of hell will not 
prevail. And I like ecclesia better than I do church. Because ecclesia means those called out, those that I have called out of Babylon out of the leadership of Nimrod and back into the things of the kingdom of God because they heard the gospel of the kingdom. Those that come in with what I'm going to do in them, that the, the full counsel of hell is not going to prevail against them. Now, I want to end with this because it gives me hope. This is I don't have a slide for this. In Daniel... It talks about when the Antichrist rises into his zenith. And it said, there will be those that know their God and will do great exploits. When you take it and look at it in Hebrew, that, that word know is the same word for the marriage chamber. That they are passionately in love with God and they will not compromise their covenant with God for anything. They are so passionate that they will be able to create exploits, great signs and wonders because they understand how to flow in the kingdom knowing that if the devil lifts up his game and takes it up to a level 10, the Holy Ghost can move through God's people and take it up to 11. And even at the zenith of the Antichrist power, there's going to be a thorn in his side called the remnant of Almighty God. And that is who God is calling us to be in this generation. That's my passion. I 